In this session, hosted by Xperit, we will be talking about managed services done right. My, na my name is Max Verhorst, and I'm the Commercial Director of Xperit, and it's my honor to be your host tonight. We have an exciting topic to talk about, and fortunately, I won't be doing it alone. I have two guests with me. Uh, on my left side, there's uh, Mark Bruins, CTO at Xperit, Managed Services. Mm -hmm. And on my right side is Casper uh, Dijkstra, DevOps Consultant. Mark, let's start with you. You uh, started your career at Xperit uh, a couple of years ago as a consultant, uh, an architect, uh, a coding architect. Uh, recently, you made the switch to become the CTO of Managed Services. Uh, why the step? Why is Managed Services so appealing to you? Well, I think that's because as a consultant, I see how Managed Services was done. And at Xperit, we are known to be a little, uh, well, opinionated. And we think that we can do managed services in a better way. That's why I stepped up. And that's why are we delivering our managed services right now for our customers. Very cool. And you're having fun? A lot. <laughs> great, <laughs> yes. great, great. And Casper, you as a DevOps consultant, you work with, uh, well, with managed services uh, daily. Mm -hmm. uh, your s field of expertise is reliability. What's so fascinating about reliability? Yeah, there's a couple aspects that I find really fascinating. So first of all, customers really care about reliability, right? Once our applications are running, we want them to run uh, like we want them to run. They should, they should behave like uh, expected. But we can also overdo it. We can actually set the bar too high for our reliability. <coughs> and the fascinating thing is what happens in those cases is that the DevOps teams start spending a lot of time into increasing the reliability, which is happening a lot, and they actually deliver way, um, they're not delivering as much customer value as they could. So I think it's a very interesting topic to, uh, to talk about today. Yeah, I can see it. You're very enthusiastic, very cool. So we'll coming back to you uh, later. Mm -hmm. um, so today we're talking about uh, managed services done right. In the, in the second part, we will come back to Casper uh, and talk about reliability. Uh, but first, let's talk about uh, well, why you are here, Mark. Um, at, Man at Xperit, we started with managed services a couple of years ago, uh, based on uh, some customers that asked us, please, uh, please do this for us, uh, which we thought was a very good idea. But at, in the same time, we say DevOps methodology is the way to produce software to help customers to uh, create business value. Um, well, these things, they might seem a bit contradictional, um, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about that. But first, maybe you can say something about uh, what is DevOps? Why DevOps? And why do we think that peop uh, companies could do things better with DevOps? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, in our experience at Xperit, but uh, a lot of the viewers will also recognize this: being uh, a DevOps-based company working with cloud, all of a sudden you have to do a lot of things a lot of things that you didn't have to do previously because now all of a sudden you're also responsible as a DevOps team for the operations um, and the development. So actually what is happening is that we went from not working with DevOps and cloud to embracing it, by, but by doing it, we embrace all of it. And I would argue that is too much to, and to be really effective, so not efficient, but effective at working with cloud and DevOps we need to understand what are the advantage, advantages of cloud and DevOps. Okay, but uh, if, if I said correctly, cloud and DevOps are proven technologies uh, that do, well, both Dev and Ops are in there. Mm -hmm. how, how, does, how does that work? Well, um, um, so that, that's right. So, so with the embracing of cloud, we ha now have new capabilities at our disposal. We can more work uh, all over the world. Our, our services can be all over the world. They can scale immensely. So we have all these new types of technologies that actually can transform our business, that can help our business grow. And in the meanwhile, we also say, okay, if we're building stuff that we're gonna run on the cloud, then the developers should also be the operators, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, but in the end, I would, I would like to argue that cloud is about effectiveness, so not efficiency. And a good way to, to picture that is basically by saying, uh, for, for instance, typically on the cloud, you can have a virtual machine. Virtual machine will require a lot of maintenance. We need to do patching. We need to have it secure, mm -hmm. etc. You can be very good at that. So you can be the patch master that does it in five minutes. You're very efficient, but you're not very effective. So what I like to argue is that 
okay, maybe for that VM, there's another service that would be more capable um, to help you build what you're doing. So maybe you shouldn't look at the VM, but you should look at serverless. So that's that's the so the base enablement from for for cloud is effectiveness effectiveness and not per se efficiency. If you look at at from that perspective to uh, DevOps, then we're also really trying to be efficient by embracing all because now this mm -hmm. all of a sudden we're responsible for the whole operation. Um, including cross-cutting concerns like security, compliance, all those types of things. And we can be very efficient at that, but not effective because now all of a sudden our DevOps team that should have focus needs to think about all these all conditions that are also there in the universe that what we, what we to, where we need to take care of. So um, if you look at it that way, then I think working fully DevOps with cloud can be really inefficient and really ineffective. Um, so in my opinion, in our opinion, modern managed services should focus on enabling customers to be effective. Okay, mm -hmm. so you build it, you run <coughs> it, mm -hmm. our paradigm around uh, DevOps. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a solid thing. It's, you, you can bend it so you can be more effective without building, running everything that you build. Yeah, exactly. So if we look at, for example, an electric car company, um, they they are going to be the best electric car company that there's ever been if they can make the best electric car. Not if their bookkeeping software or H, not uh, they're not going to be the, the very best because they have the best cleaners that clean the factories, mm -hmm. right? Or the best HR department. So if you look at it from that perspective, I would say, um, um, where do I make the difference? Mm -hmm. So, and if you, well, we're, I think we're later going to project that to the IT, but if you look at it that way for the electric car company, they're going to make the difference at, at what their core of the company is. And the core of the company is building electric cars, having the best mm -hmm. uh, battery, having the most features, having that premium feel that uh, once you're in there, you're absolutely sold. This is the best electric car. Yeah. Meanwhile, on the other part, we need to have this, other part in the company where we do, like I said, HR and all the things that surrounds mm -hmm. running a, a company. Now, well, on that part, I would like to argue, I would like to say, and that's already happening in, for example, you see a lot of uh, cleaning companies. Um, why would you not use a cleaning company and why would you set it up yourself? So basically what happens right now is that we do everything ourselves. What we could also say, let's be more effective by doing less and focus mm -hmm. on where other companies can bring us value so that we can focus on building the absolute best car in the world. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 so I'm hearing you say there's a lot of conditions for this company to produce the best car out there, mm -hmm. but they shouldn't have to care about all these conditions. They want to focus on where they really make the, yes. the impact, right? Yeah, abso and, absolutely. And, and not put focus on all these different um, aspects but yeah. only where they make the difference. Yeah, so if, if you take the cleaning example, now you have to think about, okay, I, the company needs to think about, we need to uh, buy uh, uh, cleaning supplies, we need to have personnel for that, they need to work in the night, we need to have, people are willing to work in the night because the factory is running every day, or maybe it's running 24 seven, it's a lot of things that you have to take care of. Yeah, yeah. And in the meanwhile, there are specialized companies that can help you, and so that you can build on, that you can, you can build that electric car. So, so that's the, the core context you're talking about. Yes. So I would say the core is building the best electric car and everything that you do there. So the best battery, the best display, the best whatever feature you can build to deliver the best car. And for the context, it's, well, everything that is supportive of that core. So mm -hmm. uh, HR, like I said, cleaning, the factory itself maybe, and all the things are in context, allowing you to build that, that car. That, that Great. Well, the best car. So how does that translate to what we're doing? IT, DevOps, cloud? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, it was a good, good story, but uh, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, this is also applicable to, uh, to IT, where we as in this DevOps will tend to do everything ourselves. So DevOps teams are required to think about security. They're required to think about costs. They are required to think about um, compliancy, 
uh, all mm -hmm. these types of things. So it's very broad in what they need to do. Um, they need to monitor. They need to do all of these things. And the question is, if you want to deliver, if you want to be the best company it, it, at your market, so at your, uh, 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 yeah, in your market, then should you do all of these things? Or should you have some other uh, company is helping, helping you to do that? Or as maybe a central organ in your organization, you see a lot of uh, CCOEs, for example, that focus on that core capability, enabling you mm -hmm. as a company to deliver value. CCOE, what, what's that? So that's, um, um, often you see it, especially uh, also in the Netherlands, the CCOE is the Cloud Center of Excellence. That's a central organ within your uh, uh, company that focuses on all of these things. So security, compliance, making sure if you want to deliver value that you have an environment to do so. Um, tip, sometimes they also uh, provision your environment for uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery. So all of these supportive mm -hmm. things that you need to deliver value, that's yeah. typically, well, not always in the CCOE, but CCOE is an enablement organ within such an organization. But mm -hmm. does, that doesn't really sound like DevOps. Well, it is DevOps. So they are enabling you to work DevOps. Okay. So because you can be sufficient and do whatever you want. Um, if, uh, um, well, if there's an environment where you don't have to think about, well, you have to always sort, yeah, a little more contact, more contact, always have to think about security compliance, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But holistically, as as the uh, uh, as a owner of a company, I want to see holistically: Are we secure? Are we compliant? Yeah, what does our cost do? Yeah. So holistically speaking, we want to have ISO twenty thousand uh, or ISO uh, certification or CIS or whatever. Yeah. Some some form of compliance, for example. Yeah. Um, I want to view that from a central perspective. That's always the case, and. In that, and from that central perspective, we can enable. So there's the nuance that we need to make now because we're shifting DevOps. We need to enable teams to work DevOps. So typically that would be more a self-service approach where they want to build value, they want to build new products. Okay, they should be able to do that self-service. And that is also a very different approach than what we're used to or what we see right now in the market uh, because now what we're doing is we, we um, create a ticket for the CCOE, for example, and they tell us, okay, this is gonna take so long and I need this extra information and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the managed service that for the future should enable you, a DevOps company, to accelerate. Um, but, but why do we need a managed services company rather than a cloud center of excellence, for instance? Because they, they also enable. Yeah, well, you could have a, a cloud center of excellence that works for you. Uh, and uh, uh, you can be very successful for that, but that's, well, that's a strategy you can choose. What we see at different customers, but this is different for everyone, uh, as is a lot, uh, of course, um, is that, for example, a car company that we're talking with, um, they say, okay, we don't have the capacity that we need for this, because this is very uh, uh, expertise. So you have to have the very expertise about, for example, uh, how do you configure Azure to work with on-premise? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. How do we configure DNS, virtual networking, all these security compliance things? That's a very specific subject, mm -hmm. and you can teach maybe your 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 employees to do that, uh, um, or to or host this CCOE. But a lot of companies struggle, and yeah. that's why I think um, do what you're good at, and this particularly set of expertise is something that a managed service provider should be able to do for you so that you indeed can focus. All right, so if you look at the traditional managed services companies, they, they, don't they have this as well? Don't they promise this as well, that they enable you to bring value to the market? Yeah, they, they would enable you to bring value to the market, but it, you are gonna struggle if you're working DevOps and in cloud. So if you're a traditional company and you don't work DevOps uh, because well, for some reason, and you're not transitioning yourself to the cloud, then a traditional managed service company would be fine, probably for you. But if you want to embrace DevOps, the way you're working, and to embrace cloud, then I think it's, it's not fine. Because 
what you would do for, for traditional managed service company is say, we're going to do development, you're going to do the operations. Mm -hmm. If I want something else, I'm going to do a ticket, you're going to solve it, and then the loop continues. So you're not being effective at all. Separation of concerns. Uh, yeah, then you have the classical separation of concerns indeed. Yeah. Conflicting interests. So Conflicting interests, yeah. And, and what about the difference between data centers and cloud? Is there a di different approach when you, when you look at managed services? Yeah, I think for the managed, well, uh, internally, uh, uh, yes. So f as a managed service company, we focus on being as cloud native as possible. We want as few VMs as possible. We're not going to, uh, uh, there, there's always going to be some, of course. Uh, um, but if you look at a traditional managed service or a data center, then you always have virtual machines, right? That you need to patch, you need to monitor this virtual machines on CPU, memory, etc. Mm -hmm. For us, if we, as a managed service company or maybe as a CCUE, you want to monitor, you don't really care anymore about CPU, for example, because you have infinite scaling. Yeah. Why should we care? So that's a very different way of approaching cloud and manager. Oh, sorry, cloud and data center, because the the you know, the way it works is totally different. Um, yeah. So would you say that every modern company or a company that has the ambition to grow to modernize sh should embrace this new kind? of managed services yeah or they sh or they have a uh, very uh, skilled people in company that want to do this that are actually willing to make this step and be the central organ mm -hmm. um, but we in practice we see that fail a lot i think everybody knows that one developer that has experience from your whole it tool set from your mm -hmm. ci cd to your cloud to everything to your office licenses um, you don't want to be become that company because what if that person leaves? Um, you have now a dependency. He needs to focus on all things instead of delivering value. Yes. Um, but uh, in the end, so I think, yes, managed service providers or uh, will make the difference by enabling companies to be effective so that they can work in, like we said, their core instead of their context. Um, and I think if you do not work cloud, if you do not work DevOps, then a traditional managed service company might be suited for you. But if you do, I, f I would yeah, I would say uh, think well <laughs> about what you're doing and how are you going to deliver to market, where are you, you going to be the best in? And that's probably not uh, being that, uh, that, that enablement that a managed service party can deliver. Okay. Uh, also, I have the impression that a lot of companies are struggling with the same kinds of issues. Definitely. And they're yeah, there's a lot of people at different companies working on the same problems, which is not focusing on the core, but indeed yeah. compliance, working on the backbone of your infrastructure with the VNets, with the, the, the yeah. application gateway, with all the, the, the policies. And indeed, I think you can really make a difference by, yeah, by, by um, having a meta service party working on that. Yeah, definitely. So then a great example, you need to have people that know all of that, and that is very specific knowledge. Yeah. Of course, you can have it, but the one part, do you want it? You're you're not gonna make the difference there. Mm -hmm. And the other part, these people are very wanted. Are you offering them the environment they want to work in? They want to be part of this central mm -hmm. organ that is very specific. Is your case the interesting case for them? Yeah. That's also another consideration. So the car company that I mentioned, they cannot. Well, they can attract, but they cannot keep these people because they're so specialized and they tend to do, well, centrally manage uh, things for, for the whole company, but also do a little dev work, for example. Yeah. And that's where it, uh, where the friction is and where they then, uh, well, then they're not happy anymore. So you have also, you have this knowledge, but you have to, to, have, to have the people that have this knowledge that continually mm -hmm. involved to, to be specialized in this particular part of cloud. So yeah, that's that's uh, multiple views on why you shouldn't or why you sh yeah why you shouldn't do it yourself. Okay, yeah. so for a company that has a, an on-premise environment and is looking to go to to Azure, for instance, in our case, uh, I totally get it eh, that you want to do it right right at the first try. You want to have an organization, a company that helps you with doing managed services the way you should do it. Mm -hmm. But there are also a lot of companies that are already in the cloud on Azure, doing 
well, DevOps in their way, uh, building it, running it, and doing everything themselves. Mm -hmm. Is there still value for them to consider moving to a managed services uh, model in which they don't do it themselves? Yeah, well, I think most definitely. So some of the customer we have, we have of course already um, uh, have built this foundation or or they're, they're trying to work DevOps, they're trying to work cloud and they're, they're, they're doing it. But they have to have they have a lot of concerns. Are we secure? Are we compliant? That's one of the big things. Mm -hmm. What about cost? Are we using the right cloud technologies, etc., etc., etc.? So yeah, you can do it. But if you want to do it good, eh, so then you have to to actually, from a business value, make the make the make the decision. I think what are we going to do? What are we going to focus on? And what we're not going to focus on? And yes, that could re require a migration, for example, where we say okay. You want to migrate to this model that we're talking about, where, where you have a central organ that makes sure that you deliver value. It could be a migration that you need, but it could also be a very small step uh, in enabling you to not focus on your CI CD tooling anymore, for yeah. example, but to, uh, to have a specialized company help you with that. So it depends on where you're at, um, but sometimes it requires migrations, sometimes it's just, okay. We built this ourselves. We don't want to do it anymore. Can you help us? Well, that's also another option that you have. So, are, are they looking to outsource their problems, or uh, is it really about enablement for them? Well, it could be it could be both, right? So they have a lot of problems, and they want to be enabled. Um, and then, well, sometimes we have the the conversation that they want us to solve the problems. Um, and we can solve those problems if they are solvable. Of course, there's there's more than only uh, only tech uh, at play. Um, but yeah, yeah, we we can definitely do that. Uh, but of course, we also have experience from a consultancy perspective, years of experience, a lot of MVPs, a lot of knowledge inside this CBA house, expert house that we're in, and we are very opinionated. So we also have a lot of discussion yeah. on how what you should do, what you shouldn't do, and. I think that's why we're also very valuable. Great, great. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you for this uh, f point of view. Uh, anything to add for our uh, audience? Well, um, yeah, I, sh I would I would highly recommend to, to companies to focus on wh where they're going to compete. Focus on where they're going to beat the market. And that's the... That's the, the focus on the core is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Welcome. So focusing on the core, I think that's a nice, uh, nice bridge to our uh, to our other guest, Casper. Uh, I guess good so. to see you uh, mingling in the conversation with Mark. Uh, highly enthusiastic about the subject. Um, well, Mark says companies should focus on the core and let uh, a company like <coughs> Experiment Managed Services focus on on the context. Uh, in that model, when you look at uh, core and context. Uh, what what's your view on reliability in that in that scenario? How do you make, how do you make sure that when you outsource your well the managing of your context mm -hmm. that uh, both your context and core stay reliable? Um, of course, there's a lot of uh, yeah, there's a lot of considerations that come into play into determining how reliable your application should be, and there's um, I think it's going to mingle in nice with the discussion that uh, that, that that Mark already has uh, sparked because. Really, to make uh, to make a difference as a company, you need to focus on the core. And what I think is that reli reliability is extremely important. Of course, once your application is out and running, we want it to be yeah to be running well. But it can also distract from what you should really focus on, because when you ask product owners or when you ask um, basically anyone like how much availability do you want to have in your application, well. If it's possible, let's make it perfect. 100%. 100%. Why should we go for less? But actually, when you think of it, aiming for less can actually deliver more value because you put a, b a bit less focus on reliability and more focus on where you're really going to make the difference. So you're saying 100% reliability shouldn't be your goal? Never. Never. Okay. And so of course, of course, there, there's, there's different um, categories, right? There's, there's a lot of... Um, especially mission critical components where you really want to aim for high uh, reliability and take extra investments to actually make that feasible. But there's a lot of, um, yeah, I will show some examples where you can actually, where it's better to set the bar a bit lower 
because not because we want to be less ambit uh, ambitious, but because um, it doesn't add much value to the customer to go for more. So yeah, more about that when I'm gonna go through this, uh, the slides. Yeah, so you're working for multiple customers, uh, managing their, well, their context, uh, and maybe in some cases, uh, part of their core as well. Uh, do you see different levels of ambition around reliability, availability at those customers? What I, what I mostly see is that, um, that the expectations are not well formulated. Like we want everything to, to work perfectly and we're putting a lot of sensors into the, or like this is what I, what I often see happening, that a lot of sensors are put into the system. Like, oh, what if, um, what if the, the, the CPU of the cluster reaches 100% alert? Or if this happens, alert. So we have a lot of um, triggers or a lot of notifications, but we don't know the real impact of it uh, for the customer. Um, that's what I'm often seeing. Except the CPU example that I also g gave, right? You have a high CPU, but you have auto scaling. So why should you matter? Why, why should it matter? So yeah, 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 exactly. Like, oh, you, you reached the full CPU for uh, 10 seconds. Okay. Probably the customers are just pressing F5 and it works again because auto scaling kicks in. Or, mm -hmm. um, so what I think is that, yeah, we, we put a lot of sensors into it and um, they may seem more alarming than they should be. Yeah. So what I, what, what, I, what I think is that we should form, um, we should really contemplate what reliability means for our system because there's a lot of metrics that we can track and I'm gonna show some metrics that really um, tie in closely with customer experience. We should track just a few metrics and set, like speak out our expectations. Like this is the reliability, re reliability that we expect and as long as that's the case, Okay, yeah. it's perfect. Customers are happy. Let's focus on innovative uh, changes and uh, make the impact there by really progressing the company and focus on what we want to achieve. Well, it's fun. So it can be it's distracting. Funny, it's funny that you say high reliability can have highly negative impact on your organization. I, I, I strongly um, believe that. And I also, I also see that happening. I, w I can... Um, I think it's interesting to go through a few, uh, um, yeah, to give a bit of context on like how other companies uh, are dealing with this. Yeah, go so ahead. This, so this, um, um, for instance, let's take a look at Google. So Google is a very big company. We all know it. Uh, nice company, yeah. It's yeah. pretty nice Not company. Not as nice as Microsoft, but <laughs> still nice. Yeah. And they, they came up with this whole site reliability engineering, which basically is about finding a good balance between reliability and, and, and innovation. And a lot of people um, yeah, may expect that they would want their services to be fully reliable, 100%. Um, but also they are saying this is not feasible. There's a lot of external dependencies that we have no control over. There's also a lot of internal dependencies, but 100% is, is um, not a feasible, um, yeah, not a feasible number. We cannot live up to that. Um, but maybe not, maybe not even want it, I hear you say. Exactly. So sure, we can reach this number maybe one month or two months in a row, but not consistently. And we don't want users to rely on this either. Hmm. So this, this, this is what, uh, this is from uh, a book uh, written by Google. They also claim it's actually worse for a servers and the end users to set the bar that high. And as a, con a consequence, I will show that, um, you know, errors are not necessarily uh, bad. Like, so I mentioned like some, we have external dependencies, so we cannot control everything, but also some failures may actually indicate innovation, right? You can, you can, you can even claim if you never fail, you never grow, you never learn. And the same applies for your application. Sometimes you need to take some risks to put it to the next level. And if you're always reaching full reliability, you're probably not taking enough uh, risks. But I'll come back to that in, um, in a bit. So there, they don't want to set the limit at 100%. And we actually see the same for, um, yeah, for a lot of well-known uh, services out there. 
So if you look at Azure components like Azure SQL, they put it at 99.995% uh, percent availability. Most of them are between 99 and 99.9%, .9%, but some services don't specify it because it's a public and free uh, service. Yeah, just oh, reload, right? Refresh, and maybe it will work in five minutes. Yeah, true, but also YouTube is not a critical no. uh Well, maybe for some it is, but... True. For Club Cloud it is. For Club Cloud it is, <laughs> you're actually right. But they, yeah, they, they don't specify the, the number. But um, what I'm gonna, yeah, what I'm gonna uh, share with you today is some ideas on, uh, yeah, which metrics we should track and which, um, yeah, which objectives should we set for those uh, metrics. Yeah, well, it's also an economical uh, thing, right? If you are at 99.5 and you want to go to 99.6, maybe the cost of, of, of being able to do that is way too high in, in, well, if you compare it to the gains you get. That, that, that's true for sure. What I find a very nice example to think about is, let's say that your, um, that your yearly revenue is 1 million euros. It's, it's quite a lot, right? And you already have your 99.9% availability. Yeah. Let's just make the example a bit more, uh, it's not fully uh, accurate, but let's say that revenue comes in more or less constantly in time, right? When people find the website not working, they go to, I don't know, to Amazon or, or to some other website and you're missing revenue. Yeah. You already have your 99.9% .9 availability. Now you think, well, it's not a very ambitious number, right? 99.9, .9. I see services with, uh, with, higher, uh, with higher targets. Let's do it too. So we're gonna take the, ad the additional investments with maybe like uh, redundant systems that we can do failovers to and with a lot of um yeah with a lot of additional investments and time of course that we need to put into it this additional nine is only gonna um it's only gonna give us 900 euros on a yearly basis so you could argue it's not a lot that your return of investment is only worth it when it's a very cheap and uh um yeah yeah if there's a very cheap way to implement it. Otherwise, yeah, this, this, this way of thinking helps to, yeah, to put it in, in another light, like, okay, 99.9% .9 could be good enough for your service. Maybe it's not, but it really depends on the, uh, yeah, on the context. Obviously, okay. And that's, that's true, like, there's some point where the, the, the um, yeah, where the costs just increase exponentially, like, uh, this is this is more or less what it looks like like if we if we achieve a very low reliability nobody wants to use our service rate who wants to use this web shop or who wants to, to buy stuff there no one so we're missing out on a lot of revenue then there's the sweet spot where it's pretty damn reliable but not perfect and then if we want to um, go higher yeah probably the, the the investment costs are gonna yeah increase exponentially you really should uh, contemplate whether it's worth it for you. All right. So anything more on this topic, topic of the impact of high availability? Uh, yeah, there's actually, uh, yeah, so there's, um, of course, there's the, the, the financial aspect. But what I also find a very important factor is if you're gonna, if you're gonna, um, if you're gonna set the bar higher, it's also going to impact your DevOps teams, right? If we um, if we set the um, the objective to ninety nine point ninety nine percent, yeah, on a monthly basis, we can only have four and a half minutes of downtime. If if we're looking at availability as a reliabi reliab reliability uh, indicator, so what happens in these teams is they're being paged, an alert shows up, immediate stress, right? Yeah. Like it needs to be resolved pretty much instantaneously. And I'm not saying that this is not feasible. I mean, also here you can, you can come up with very elaborate um, ways to, to auto fix incidents. And there's a lot of uh, things that we can do, but uh, yeah. But, but are there customers that require, well, our managed services uh, organization to fix things within five minutes. Does that, does that happen? 
does that happen? I mean, of course, if if, if it's really about the, the if it's really about the the, the 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 core of your system, let's say the, the 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 checkout basket of your shopping cart, maybe maybe you want to have those things, right? Yeah. But if it's about the the part where you're generating your invoices, maybe it doesn't have to work always. It just has to work. Uh, yeah, whenever you need to generate an invoice. Yeah, so the invoice can be sent five minutes later instead of instant, right? So that's the, the yeah, exactly. Different. For the basket, you want to have the checkout immediately. Yeah. So, so it's not about lowering the bars. It's just about finding the right height of the bar for every, well, every uh, every case, every different case. That, 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 that's exactly what it's all about. So the, of course, the, the, the title of this talk has a provocative title, like... Uh, less can be more but of course we shouldn't just go for less right no we, we we shouldn't but we have to find out what are the uh the real indicators of 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 success or like the real indicators of what customers care about and then um yeah set realistic targets for those metrics it is not always like here i'm talking about availability but if there's a lot of metrics that we can talk about and that's uh, so one of them is latency, of course, like you want, uh, let's say 95% of the requests to be handled within a certain time. You can set targets for that. You can set targets for the, 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 the freshness of your data that the most uh, recently, um, um, yeah, the most recently added data is no older than some amount of milliseconds, for instance. So there's a lot of targets that we can talk about, but it's really about uh, finding the real th the right metrics for your uh, system yeah so, and also for your business right because if you take the basket example then it depends on your system how high that bar should be should it be very high in terms of uh, availability or should it can it be lower because you actually don't require to make all that cost all that maintenance all that operation that's what mm -hmm. i understand right yes I, I think that's a good uh, rating of it yeah but i could imagine uh, a scenario in which the availability isn't so much the problem but more the reliability of the of the data for instance if you if you have a an order in a basket mm -hmm. and your system fails because it's down i think you're more interested in okay when i come back and refresh in five minutes is my is my data still still there or, or should i reorder everything and search on the website again yeah ex exactly so so maybe that's uh <coughs> so most likely that metric is one that we want to set a very high target for the correctness of your data. Yeah. yeah. In the uh, yeah, so so it's really about finding out what what truly matters for your uh, for your for your business. And how how do you find that out? What's how do how do you find that out? I think by by uh, yeah, really starting the discussion about it by by because reliability is something that everyone cares about. But like I said, we don't often speak out our expectations like what really matters what is the the, the the core also for our business and to um to usually find out pretty pretty fast when talking with customers what is really the core at the core of their uh, at the of their business but it's it's a very different uh it's a very different approach from what is traditionally done, which is just putting in a lot of sensors, and when something fires, okay, fix it. Yeah. Now work on this. So would so you say that that companies, in this moment, we talked about focus, eh? focus on your core, not in your context, focus on important things. Do you think companies focus on the on the right metrics, on the right things? I I I, I see it uh, more often not happening than happening. So I I, I think that's. Um, we're often, just like you said, we're often doing too much, tracking too many metrics and want everything to, to, to look uh, green and look, uh, yeah, just uh, working as expected. But I think also here the key thing is to just pick a few metrics that really matter for your customers and to focus on that. And as long as these alerts are not, are not being triggered, well, let's do cool stuff. Let's really make a difference and let's not be too... Uh, yeah, let's not get uh, stressed out about uh, the, the impact. So, so but, how, how but, do you but do if that? even if you pick the right metrics, it's good to set realistic expectations. Of course, taking yeah. into account the external dependencies and all that, because even if you're tracking the right tools, like if you're gonna say, "Hey, let's go for 99 point, uh, 
like if we're going for the 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 the, the five nine uh, objective yeah, yeah. feel yourself to be resolved immediately and the key, th the key thing here is to really focus on the customer impact like what are they going to do if uh, this yeah. target is not met so how do you identify the metrics that do impact your business uh is it, is it a different question from what you just asked <laughs> maybe maybe there's a subtle difference yeah. But <laughs> yeah, but i think basically how are we going to measure business impact what are the we, we can measure f cpu but uh, like uh, max said we can also uh, see the data so so i think that's this for every company that just must be different if you're an energy company then you want to do any other things than when you're a web shop right so how what's the process of, of finding that yeah, you don't but want to talk about cpu and availability as a number per se but more okay what does that mean for for our customers and that translation how how do you how do you do that is there a, a, a an objective that we can set or something and how do we get to that objective for example or how does that work um yeah there's actually uh yeah that, that i'm gonna discuss that in a bit but maybe okay. it's okay. first nice to to focus on the other uh like uh, impacts of setting the, the, the availability to high sure yeah of course yeah Go ahead. I, I, i'll come back to that in a bit with the, sure. the service level ob ob uh, objectives mm -hmm. so the um yeah so we discussed two factors of 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 uh yeah, two consequences that may happen if you don't contemplate well enough what reliability means to you and may um, set the bar too high. Um, yeah, the third one is that there's very little safety margin in your uh, yeah in your code, right? In your in your um, application. So when uh, it, it 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 ties in um, closely with this argument when something goes wrong we can no longer achieve the target, right? Mm. Um, so what, is, what you usually see here is because there's very little safety margin, um, innovation is halted. Because there's always a disbalance between uh, reliability and, and new features. We already saw this back in the days when we had development and operation teams, right? The development teams want to build and, and bring the product to the next level. And the operation teams are like, ho oh, oh, ho, it's reliable now. Maybe, <laughs> don't touch it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe let's yeah. be hesitant, and that can still happen in DevOps teams when when the teams feel a fear of 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 of, of failure, or when they there's a big risk that uh, a code change incurs a bit of downtime or some data correctness, in which case we can fail fast and just roll back the deployment rate. But we don't want to encourage a culture where this this fear is really manifested um, so also in that case we should aim yeah we should aim for realistic goals for the reliability metrics focus I see focus again talk a lot about focus yes yeah I thought this was about many services <laughs> <laughs> well focus is important right yeah in everything oh here they are service level objectives so here they are so we uh, Yeah, so the, the already alluded to this, we shouldn't just measure everything that can be measured. Nope. Yeah, let's see if it's coming back now. Yeah, we traditionally we're, we're uh, companies are measuring too much. Um, so we're talking mm -hmm. about the, 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 the server side monitoring, also known as black box monitoring, which shows that something is not right, something seems to be off, but we don't see the effect on the uh, application users. On the other side, we have white box monitoring where we're really tracking the real life data, like what kind of requests are coming in, what kind of, um, yeah, what kind of, 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 of uh, API interaction is there, what kind of database query queries are being run. Um, and this really shows uh, useful information on how the users are uh, experiencing the application. Because if we see that certain queries are always incredibly uh, slow, I mean, we can easily filter these out and this gives meaningful information. 
if we just see, hey, the database is busy, which mm. is the black box monitoring part, yeah, something is wrong, but what does it mean? Is there a lot of people using it right now, or are there a few users that are really impacted? And when you look at the real life data, um, yeah, you really see what the, it's more easy to translate to the user experience. And you can set targets for that, like, hey, 99% of all queries should be executed within this time, for instance, because um, so is, is that, that a makes service level objective? We have seen the word on the slides. If you um, what do you mean with an objective? So what I mean with the objective is um, the objective is the objective that you want to achieve on a monthly basis or a weekly basis for the indicators that you care about. The indicators, these are called the service level indicators. Mm -hmm. um, so I recommend to just pick a few that are meaningful, like the ones with the database queries. Uh, so, so if I need to make an SLO, it's more like, okay, for my business, I'm a web shop. I need to make sure that the data is correct. So for correctness of data, I want to have this number and a very high number because it's really important to me. That's then my objective of my team. Well, yeah, is that how I so, so also here you cannot say 100% of data should be correct, but you can, you, you can definitely. But it's high, right? Because I'm a web shop, it's yeah, yeah, high. You, Maybe for another company, it can be low. So, so one example that you could set as an objective here is 99.99% yeah, of all data mm -hmm. of last month should be correct. And you can actually use data injectors for this where you know the, the expected outcome, mm -hmm. how it should be uh, written in the database, for instance, and you can really, you can really measure this. But that's an SLO that I can make, a service level objective. This would be a very important SLO for you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. So we, uh, yeah, so it's split into uh, different, um, yeah, surface level categories, the indicators, the objectives, and the agreements. So the indicators is what do we care about? The objectives are what do we want to achieve? Like what is the, 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 the number that we want to see, the percentage? Mm -hmm. So in this case, the amount of uh, bullseyes per uh, thousand uh, darts, for instance, but then <laughs> translate it into something IT. Mm -hmm. And then you have the service level agreement is what you communicate outwards to, to your customers. This is the guarantee. These are also the, the um, agreements that we saw at the beginning of Microsoft Teams and Slacks. This is what you're gonna, um, this is what you're gonna be able to deliver guaranteed. And usually we set the internal goal, the service level objective a bit lower but we also want to get that. Yeah. But if for whatever reason, we're not living up to that, we should really reflect on that, see if we need to, uh, yeah, probably we need to take more precautions or. Uh, so we're actually working harder than what we promised to our customers. So we are working harder than we promised. Because the SLO should be higher than the SLA. That's what you said. Oh, that's true, that's true. So yeah. we're working harder. I mean, uh, uh, uh. I mean, it's an it's an objective, right? It's something you really want to achieve, but if you don't, if if, if you don't, um, let's say let's say there was really a big incident in the in the uh, like at Azure, like Azure SQL was just down for for three hours. This is really fully out of our control. So maybe we don't live up to the objective because of that, but we don't want there to be financial consequences, right? but we should reflect on how come that we couldn't achieve it because it seemed to be a realistic. Yeah, uh, well, over delivering is always nice as, as long as you never <coughs> under deliver, right? And there, that's where the SLA comes into play. Yeah, yeah, true. And, and, and this uh, ties in with your, with your question, like how do we find out what customers truly care about? There's only a handful of, of, of indicators that are, uh, that I think cover all cases. So you can basically take a look at them with the uh, product owner and find out in this discussion, which ones do we really care about? And usually it's just three of them because, because um, when you're talking about big data processing pipelines, most likely you, you want to have a big throughput, right? Mm -hmm. You always want data to be processed yeah. and fast. Availability would be nice to have it, 
But even if it's not available, if new data, data cannot be sent for a few minutes, most likely the queue is still big enough, the data is still being transferred, right? And by, by, by um, talking about it, seeing what the, the, the context is, you usually find out, um, yeah, you usually find out uh, pretty fast. These are, I think, uh, the only metrics that we should really care about and just pick them uh, wisely. Okay. Um, yeah, so we we discussed this part. The agreement is usually a bit lower than what we than what we're actually trying to uh, to achieve. And this is a very nice. Um, I think this is a very nice reference frame for setting your SLOs, your service level objectives. I think for um, I think you should really really think about what is the uh, yeah. How mission critical is this component that we're setting the SLO for? Probably you're gonna pick one of these at the left side, and I think that yeah, that that usually uh, the targets for availability and latency that you see at the right are pretty accurate. If it's really critical, okay, f go for the additional nine. If it is high, you go for 99.9 percent .9 and. Yeah, you have some uh, some difference between fast and 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 um, services and services that may take a bit more time to respond. Mm. Um, but I think this is a very a, a very useful uh, table to look at when setting at SLS. Cool. And then uh, yeah, then once once you've set the, uh, the 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 objectives, you can track the the real life data and see. Yeah, how it relates to the to the objective rate, so you can get nice uh, visuals like this. So, how successful are you in achieving your objectives? Yeah, exactly. And when you when you keep on tracking that, you know better what to focus on. So, right? is this is this something that you would present to your customers well, or would you compare it to the agreement? I no, no, no. For sure, the 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 the, the objective. We we do want to. Uh, yeah, we do want to 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 meet up to the uh, service level objective. Yeah, we want to satisfy that. So this is what I would show with the compared to the, to the uh, objective. Um, so yeah, the the takeaways from this is, don't track everything. Just pick. Take a look at the at the at the picture that I, that I showed of the useful indicators. Pick two of them, maybe three. Set realistic expectations w um, about that, um, and also embrace some form of failure. Right? Some are out of our control. Some are due to uh, us innovating rapidly, which may. Uh, well, you make yeah, it sound so nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, uh, I see. I see alerting. Uh, that that's uh, something I wanted to ask you about. Um, I see a lot of companies um, well working successfully with software uh, without even having SLOs, SLIs. Well, they mm -hmm. sh probably have an SLA, but uh, not no, none of the others. Yeah. Um, what what would be the value for for their for them because they seem to be doing well. Yeah, true. So uh, you're saying okay. Nice, all these fancy terms, but what do we actually, uh, how can we actually uh, use that? Um, so one of the, um, yeah, one of the problems that I often see when you're not setting these uh, objectives is that alerting becomes, I wouldn't say a big mess, but it becomes um, inefficient. Right, because we're tra like I mentioned, we're tracking a lot of different um, metrics in our system, and when they're off, an alert is sent. Usually, um, in most uh, DevOps teams, there are these alerts that we all know are false positives. Ah, there it comes again. Okay, let's not take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Right, we don't want alerts to to work like that. We want them to be meaningful, and more importantly, we want them to reflect 
events that really matter. That that really matter for the end users, right? So um, and this in general is hard. Like from all the the, the 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 big bulk of data we have, how do you filter those uh, those uh, events that are really accurate? Now how can and you focus usually, on what's important? Yeah, how do you focus on what's important and not be distracted when, uh, yeah, when irrelevant things happen? Yeah. Or what also happens a lot? How do you make sure that you're gonna find out when your customers are impacted? Right, because it's it. There's um, implementing alerts is easy. You can do it in a few minutes, and you have alerts, right? Maybe, it, maybe I couldn't, but <laughs> I think you could. Yeah. Maybe, maybe for you, ten minutes. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that you could that, that you could do it. But implementing good alerts is harder, but it is very essential into this whole approach. Um, yeah, where we're where we're setting the service level objectives, because we we have a certain we have some wiggle room, some room for failure, right? This is natural, but when it's, um, yeah, when it's being threatened, when it's really uh, going down fast, we want to be notified immediately. And I think there's a whole art to that, to doing that, right? And I want to, uh, yeah, I will show you what it brings to the table. To uh, yeah, So what you're basically saying is that companies are throwing away money because they're wasting time on alerts that aren't relevant because they didn't, well, they didn't create SLOs. Um, yes, mostly because the alerts are not on these uh, core um, indicators that I, that I introduced before, yeah. <coughs> right? If, you, if, if, if you're tracking, um, Basically, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I think is the very big win is we're being triggered on events that matter, and yeah. we want that, yeah. Right. So, so what you to recap what I heard? Traditionally, we monitor everything, and we don't know when we have an alert, what is happening, and what we can do now with this new monitoring strategy is measure business impact, and we can only get an alert when we are impacted. That's uh, yeah, maybe even before the impact. That's a, that's exactly what it's what it's about. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's a nice way to uh, to put it. So, um, so the art of alerting. So we, um, I already mentioned there's some. Um, it's pretty hard to do it right, but we we need to have it right so we don't risk not uh, achieving our targets. Right, because we, we, we do want to achieve our targets. Obviously. Of course. Um, but how are we being notified when something uh, relevant happens? So what we, uh, there's three things that we should always take into account when we're setting up alerts. The first one is the alerting window. So the, the, the over how much time are we gathering data before the alert can go out? And the second one is the reset time. What often happens in alerts is that after a failure happens, new alerts keep on being sent, which actually, uh, yeah, may may um, only add noise in that in that sense. It has it has noise, and it may actually it may even uh, cause the DevOps teams to disable the alert because you know. Yeah. Is in 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 ninety percent of all cases, it is not a good alert, mm -hmm. right? It's really about filtering the right uh, data. So we want the reset time, um, yeah, to be to be very low, right? When the application is in a normal state again, maybe still with occasional failures, but within the boundaries of of uh, what is expected, we want it to stop. We don't want to see this alert anymore. Uh, and of course, the precision we want to be high, right? We want to filter out events that we don't care about. Mm. And what we often see in uh, <clears throat> what we often see happening in uh, um, traditional alerting is okay. We have we have our metric, and yeah, when it's um, when it is above a certain threshold, 
like the amount of errors thrown per, per minute or the unavailability. When it's above a threshold, we want to throw, um, we want to throw an alert. So what happens in this case is we have a quick response time rate. We, we, we can set the uh, threshold, <coughs> I mean the alerting window to half a minute. And then when, when something is happening, we're being alerted. And now at this point, we can already use the, 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 these key indicators, right, that I talked about. We can use these, but still have um, useless alerts because what this whole site reliability engineering is about is we have our service level objective. Let's put it at 99.9%. .9%. This means that we have an error budget of, uh, let's say it correctly, 0.001% of all the, uh, so let's say if we have an error budget on the um, availability, so we can calculate how much down, downtime we can have a month, mm. right? And we can actually draw that um, over time. So at the beginning of the month, we still have a lot of error budget, and at the end of the month, we have nothing left. So what this means is that over time, as time passes, we can, um, yes, more and more errors can occur and are still acceptable. But what this way of alerting doesn't take into account is that um, this is part of the show, right? S sometimes errors happen and it's not significant. So with this kind of alerting, we also see a lot of uh, false positives, also because they don't have to endure these errors. Just a, a short spike, okay, we're being notified. We don't have to focus anymore on what we were doing, but we're, so we don't want to, uh, we don't want that. So what we see is that, um, yeah, there there is a short response time, especially when the error rate is, is high, we're being notified very quickly. For lower error rates, it takes a bit longer, but Usually this part is correct, but uh, um, yeah, it's really the false positives, but we don't want to use that way of alerting. Then we're moving on to a slightly less naive way of alerting. This is where we say, okay, so we increase the, the alerting window. Let's not take half a minute, let's take 10 minutes. Let's take uh, half an hour, half an hour. If the errors keep on accumulating over this time period, then we should be alerted. But what happens in this, in this case is we're taking too much risk because it takes a long while before we're being notified. Mm -hmm. What if there's really something, what if the whole application is down or if, if something is really impacting all of your customers, you will be notified after half an hour, right? This is something that we, that we, that we don't want. And moreover, you can also have um, you can also have multiple time periods. Um, yeah, you can have multiple time periods where the errors are high, but then they stop, right? Here, after a few minutes, there's no more errors. Then this alert is not being triggered. And there we go again. So the worst case scenario is that you're not, um, you're not going to, live up to the service level objective while you were never notified. Mm. A lot of errors were thrown, but we didn't know because of the way the alerts were implemented. So that's also uh, something we definitely don't want. Um, <clears throat> so also what we can do is we can increase the, uh, the, the, the um, yeah, we can increase the alert window so this is, okay, wait, I made a small mistake. What I, um, what I showed here in this case is the duration of the alert. So the alert is only thrown when for a certain period, the errors keep on, uh, yeah, keep on being above a threshold. But we can also increase the window, the alert window. Let's say we're tracking data of the last hour. So we have a whole period um, so in this case, we suddenly have a huge spike of, um, of errors impacting our reliability. 
So what happens in this case is, yes, we're being notified um, pretty much immediately, but then because we're collecting data over such a big period and the spike was big, we keep on being alerted for a long while. Mm. So that's also very, uh, yeah, very Inno annoying. Inefficient. It, it's inefficient. And now, what I'm, um, yeah, what I want to share with you is that with this whole um, theory of, of service level objectives, we can um, make these alerts a lot smarter by looking at the um, expected amount of errors and by seeing the, the difference on uh, yeah, the current state of the application. So, because this is something that teams would usually struggle with? Um, what do you mean with this? Like the whole alerting? Oh, you the say the whole alerting part? You I, I say we, for we, sure, yeah. we have to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Be but that's because they struggle with, with the whole idea of implementing the right alerts with the right window and the right etc. etc. Exactly. So the so the, 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 the three ways of alerting that I showed I think are the most common ways to implement it. But they all have serious drawbacks. Um, and I, I really think that um, the whole concept of, of, of the um, burn rates, which is basically how um, how many errors are being generated now compared to what we're expecting, right? How much unreliability unreli is there versus how much expected unreliability unreli is there. Yeah. By comparing those numbers, we can make the alerts a lot smarter. Okay, now please explain. So, um, I mentioned the, 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 um, the error budget already. So, for, yeah, basically for every kind of uh, service level indicator, we can, um, we can actually formulate what does it mean for us in this month? How much, like, what is this am expected amount of failure? What does it amount to? So how much downtime or how much, um, how much unsuccessful um, uh, status responses do we expect? So you, you could say something like, for this month we expect, or a hundred errors, that's, that's to be expected in some kind of way. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, of course, there's some nuance to it. You have the, 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 the you have the time based, mm, yeah. uh, you have the time based, uh, cases for availability. We know how many seconds there are in this month. We know what we expect. So we know how much downtime we can, we can have, mm -hmm. of course, with, um, with error rates is different. You need to collect data over, um, yeah, per 10,000 requests, for instance, or per, per uh, standardized amount of, uh, of data. So there's, there's a bit of nuance there, but you can, for every, for every indicator, you can define your error budget. Like how much failure are we expecting to see? Mm -hmm. and, then by, uh, and then by seeing how we're, um, um, yeah, so let's, look at availability again, so we can draw this in time. Like we, um, we start at no errors, right? At the beginning of the month, no downtime. And at the end of the month, we can have, let's say 30 minutes downtime with the 99.9% with the target. So we can basically plot that over time to get a, a graph like this. So after 30 days, we expect that we have burned the error budget uh, completely. This would be a burn rate of one. So what happens in this case is continuously there is, or like every uh, minute there is a bit of downtime and this happens continuously. Yeah. And in this case, we're still, um, we're still satisfying the objective, right? On target. Our target, yeah. And every burn rate that is higher means we're spending it faster. So yeah. if the burn rate is two, it means we're going to spend everything in half a month. Yeah. If the burn rate is, is, is 0 
great. Okay, we're only going to spend it in two months. Yeah. So um, now by defining a this 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 burn rate, um, we can see how we're doing. Um, yeah, we can see how we're doing in time now. So if we look at the at this example here, we see that we didn't live up to the to the target. And if we um, we could have implemented good alerts for this, because already at this point we were we had burned um, errors at a rate that was actually too high, and we should be notified of that. So what we um, what we can do now with these burn rates is greatly improve our alerting technique because we know how much um, yeah we we know what is um, an acceptable um, the acceptable range of of, of errors yeah <coughs> so and if how have, we're relating uh, to that if I have thirty errors a month in a month of 30 then I can do only do one a day and if I see three a day then I know oh yeah if, if, if you suddenly see three of them in one day yeah okay yeah your burn rate is literally three makes if sense you, you extrapolate you know you're in trouble yeah exactly yeah so that's, that, that's the whole charm of, 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 of this and then what we can do is set up alerts based on this uh, burn rate so what we uh, what we what we uh, what we can gain with this is is clear, at least to me. I hope mm -hmm. for you also a bit. We at the end of the month we want to end up somewhere here. We want to have error budget left. So when we see that our the actual burn rate is going too fast, we should be triggered. The 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 the, uh, the tricky part about this is what do you set as your parameters, right? Is the burn rate, is it acceptable if it's, um, if it's, like should we set the limit to bigger than one? I don't think so, because it's perfectly fine if you, like you, you could be, you could spend zero error budget here, then have a steep drop, and then stay at this point. Mm -hmm. This is not necessarily uh, bad, right? Yeah, so, so if, if uh, you have zero errors and then a new feature comes out because you're working in DevOps, then it's all of a sudden you see errors and the DevOps team is alerted because the burn rate is burning so fast. That's the, the, <coughs> the case. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. We, we should be notified indeed if it's burning very fast. Um, but only when there's... Um, yeah, when there's real impact. And, and the, the thing that's hard to implement with, um, still at this point with these alerts, is how do you set the parameters? What is the, what is the unacceptable burn rate? Yeah. Because bigger than one, that's not it. Because it's perfectly fine if it's two for a bit and, and then, then goes zero. back to normal. Yeah. What, is the, what is the time frame that we should collect data over? You're still running into some problems here. But now what, um, what is a very nice way to, uh, to filter the real relevant events is by using two time windows, two alerting windows. So you have a you have a big um, window of let's say let's say one hour, and you have a short time window of five minutes, for instance. So what we what we're tracking with the big window is okay over this over this um, full hour we're spending error budget, right? We're spending it at, at, at an unacceptable pace. So that's, that, that's not good. But if we're only using this big window, then we have this problem again that the alerts keep on being uh, generated because we're collecting data over such a big time and it keeps on being mm -hmm. unacceptable. But when, when we add a small time frame on top of this, we can set the alerts in such a way that they're only being triggered when the big window finds uh, violations of the error budget, but the short window too. So that means that in the long run, yes, it seems like uh, customers are impacted and it's still happening. Yeah. So yeah, what, yeah. what we get in this case is we are being notified within 
let's say, two minutes. Because also in that time period, um, we see that the error budget is still in danger. So in this case, what we can achieve is there can be some violations of the of the uh, of the burn rate. Sometimes it can be high for a bit, but that's um, it's only a problem if it keeps on being so. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't solve itself, if it doesn't, if it really, uh, yeah, puts our target into danger. Yeah, this is a very nice way to uh, to uh, to achieve that. Cool. Which I think um, also lets dev let uh, DevOps teams put way more focus on what matters to them and be not, yeah, to have this guarantee that we will find out when our customers are impacted. If not, exactly, let's push this cool feature. Let's, let's, let's work on stuff that really, uh, yeah, that really matters because we set a target for what the what is important to the customer and we're still uh, living up to that awesome so i hear a lot about burn rates and error rates and rates and alerts what's the the relationship between error rates and burn rates for instance <coughs> so the so the error um do you mean the error budget or the error rates? The error rates, yeah, that's the what you talked about. Yeah, the error rates. So the, this is in the, um, let's see, how would you define that? So the, 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 the current error rate is the amount of errors being uh, thrown at this moment. And you can have an, uh, you can have an uh, objective for that, right? Yeah. Because this really, if a lot of exceptions occur in your application, like of course your customers are gonna uh, notice. Um, but that's that's very different from the error budget, which is, hey, this is the amount of uh, errors, for instance, that we expect in a certain time period. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's not a matter of seeing every error, but more of seeing how how the number compares to what you expect uh yes yeah that, 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 that that's the exactly that's the, the the burn rate of one that shows okay this is what we would expect yeah um okay and i i, I believe that you can talk days about this uh is it is this really what helps the teams to become more effective and more efficient i, I think so, i think so i think so for sure like it's uh I think the alerting is is um, also a condition. Like you want this to be in place so you can work most um, efficiently or effectively. You make a. <laughs> <laughs> right, this, this is also something that that you really should have thought about. It should be in place, um, and then you can really focus on on on. Um, um, then you have the guarantee that you're being. Um, yeah, that you're being notified when your customers are really, uh, yeah. When they're impacted. Yeah, when they're impacted, mm -hmm. basically, yeah. So that w would that be the real win of this? Why would a company want this? It's because of that, that they are alerted when it really counts. Yeah, so this is, th this is the part that matters. But I think, the, like I said, this is more of a condition. You want this to be in place. But I think the real win is to... Um, yeah, to really have it insightful what these goals are, right? Like the metrics that you're tracking and uh, yeah, the part before, that's something that, that really gives a big win to your uh, company. All right, all right. So what about reliability versus innovation? Yeah, so this is, uh, I think this is this is something, uh, th th yeah, this is uh, what it really brings to the table. Um, when we uh, see that our burn rate is actually doing um, bad, right? We have this graph, okay, it's a bit far back, but we, we have this graph and we see that we're actually doing worse than expected. Now, <coughs> now coming back to, the, to the, the title, finding the balance between innovation and reliability, we know that we're actually disappointing the end users, right? Mm -hmm. They have higher expectations and 
we're not we're not actually uh, yeah we're not making that happen so in this case this burn rate can really help us to to say okay it's very cool that we want to uh, that we want to put this new uh, feature in 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 beta mode into our product but it's it's gonna cause more uh it's, it's too much of a risk right now we should really uh focus on what matters now is making the application more reliable again maybe spending uh, yeah really finding out why this 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 burn rate is doing so bad what is what is the cause of that should we invest more resources into uh into into um yeah smart ways to improve that at least we should be cautious we should uh really focus on reliability here and see how we can achieve the uh, the objective on the other hand we have the case where it's yeah pretty much like we expect it to be in this case we should be careful but we don't have to stress out we shouldn't push like very risky uh or or uh, code changes maybe or we, we shouldn't experiment with new technologies but we're still we're still doing yeah like expected mm-hmm. like uh but then at the point where we're doing uh better than expected this is where um this is the part where you can really make the difference with innovation at this case in this case where um actually being unrealistically reliable we don't even want uh customers to to rely on that like at google when they're too reliable for a while they actually create outages intentionally sometimes that's what i did at at, at chubby because they don't want uh, people to rely on this because then in the future when we fail to do that which statistically speaking has to happen they will be disappointed well if they um um so it's yeah it's, it's also about setting realistic expectations but in in this in this um in this case when we're doing better than expected it it may mean and i think i strongly believe that that we're not taking uh, enough uh, enough risk we're not really doing uh, cool things that make a difference which always incur like a small risk or may uh, uh, yeah may even uh, impact the, 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 the reliability numbers a bit but when we're seeing that we're doing uh, too good actually I encourage uh, DevOps teams to experiment with new technologies to get rid of technical debt and maybe replace your your infrastructure as code by something more modern that is uh, easier to maintain or um, cool stuff like 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 case engineering i can i can mention a lot of things that really uh, will improve the, the the customer experience especially when you're talking about cool new features of course um, but there is there is this wiggle room to just um, innovate fast to fix and the roof when the sun is shining exactly yeah and I think that's uh, yeah. Coming back to your question, I think that's that's the real win that you know when to uh, when you can actually do that mm. and don't give a bit of um, yeah to also have a strong argument like hey these yeah. are the numbers we can do that yeah. because often it's based on gut feelings right like should we already do this shouldn't we be a bit more careful and now with now these, you have a quality bar where you can see that. Yeah. Right. So, so you can see what if I do I have business impact? How good are we doing? We are doing great. Okay, team, let's build new features that are gonna rock the world. And if you exactly. see that you're becoming unstable, then it's the time for the team to work on stabilizing. That's exactly. Uh, okay. I, I have a very objective measure of this. Well usually it's like I feel like we're too unreliable mm. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So that's the I would say that's the that's the real win. So, so Mark, if you talk with customers, is that something they worry about? The balance between reliability and innovation? Yeah, definitely. And it's very, uh, it's also very hard to measure because they probably talk to someone who says, 
your system is unreliable, it isn't working. But in the global picture, we from engineering see are seeing that it is because we're focusing on a lot of things instead of what should matter. So I think that it, it's really helpful from the, also from the business perspective to have a good indication we are losing money. If we're not losing money, we can create new features, work on new cool stuff. So I think that's uh, definitely something that uh, a lot of customers uh, would, would like to have. Nice. Yeah. So Kasper, uh, anything more about innovation? Anything more about innovation? Uh, no, I think that's uh, that sums it up nicely. But I uh, I can uh, recap what we uh, what we uh, learned today. So, uh, in terms of reliability, you should really think about what 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 matters to you, what ma what matters to the end user, yeah. and set realistic uh, goals for that. Be aware that <coughs> the black box monitoring, I wouldn't say it's useless not at all right if if your database is going towards uh is, is really reaching its limits we want to be notified because there is going to be future customer impact but the combination of this with real life data uh, real application data that really uh, they can really make a difference and uh, especially then when you have these alerts in place these multi-window alerts that are based on your key indicators, you can really, uh, yeah, you can really uh, yeah, be sure that you're not gonna miss, uh, yeah, you're not gonna miss these cases where customers are really starting to complain about your, uh, about your products. Um, and by making your burn rate insightful, you can just look at it every week or, e or every day during the standup and see, hey, what should we focus on uh, this week? Yeah. How are we going to make the difference? So cool. That's, uh, cool. Well, thank you for that. It was a nice, uh, nice insight in how you can use the the different acronyms uh, SLA, SLO, <laughs> SLI for uh, becoming more reliable. Very good. So, uh, well, that brings us to uh, the the summary of to, of of tonight. Um, well, it's, it has been uh, almost two hours, so a uh, very, very nice talk with you both. Uh, first, uh, we talked about uh, managed services and how they can help companies to focus more on the core uh, and less on the context. Mm -hmm. We talked about reliability, uh, about all well, the different indicators and uh, uh, the things that, can, that you can use to become more reliable. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, um, it w it's very nice to talk, of course, and people can watch, uh, watch this, uh, this talk. But if companies really want to further explore and see how we can use these concepts to help them improve, how would you say they should uh, go forward? Yeah, so so they should definitely contact us. We have a very uh, well low-hanging fruit, I would say, in forms of workshops and for to explore this more. Also, mm -hmm. what this means for your business. So uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we're we're happy happy to talk about uh, how this could benefit your company right yeah. and in those workshops will the slos and slis also be yeah we have an sre workshop or uh, um, if you turn it around you could call it the <coughs> business impact workshop because you actually can measure what is the business impact if something goes on yeah cool well yeah. very nice very nice so yeah, I w uh, anything to add exactly like <coughs> the nice thing about the workshop is that you can really yeah put all this theory into practice for your company right to mm -hmm. really distinguish like the, what are these keys th these key indicators and what are the targets that uh, yeah yeah because you can make it very concrete by uh, applying it to your own business definitely yeah cool sounds good so with this I want to thank you guys for your uh, attendance for your nice uh, information nice insights uh, I want to thank you Mark thank Casper for thank the you, giving uh, an insight in what you do uh, daily I want to thank the audience, of course, for, for being here with us. And, uh, well, I wish you all a great evening. And if you want to know more about these concepts, I want to talk up about uh, with us about what this can do for your company, uh, please reach out. Go to experience.com and uh, please leave a message. Thank you. Oh, yeah.